Uh, well, Spence, uh, you and I met in 1971, I recall that. 1971? Yeah, Green ICC. Team. Green Pain. Yeah, yeah, the ICC. Yeah, ICC. <laughs> All right. Well, Hello what, week. what inspired you to start diving? Well, in 1954, I was in the Air Force, and uh, I picked up some books at the library because I was always interested. And of course, I was stationed in McCord Air Force Base at uh, in Tacoma, mm -hmm. and surrounded by water. And I've always been interested in diving because I think that was the time that Sea Hunt was one of the major television programs. Yeah. And so I got a couple of books from the library. One was called uh, was called uh, The Blue Continent by Folco Consili, uh, an Italian author. And that thing was so inspirational. Good pictures, uh, just a lot of uh, real inspiring stuff about the adventures of being underwater. And then I picked up Hans Haas's book, we come from the sea and Manta, and after reading all the books that I get my hands on, then I uh, decided it was time for me to start to learn to dive. And at that time, there were no training facilities in Tacoma. So I went down to Washington Hardware, and I bought a uh, Healthways uh, regulator, a two O's regulator, with the Hope Page non-return valve mouthpiece. <laughs> and, guaranteed. Uh, yeah, guaranteed. <laughs> and a book by E.R. Cross on underwater safety. Mm -hmm. And I read the manual and went down to American Lake and uh, put on the scuba gear. And, uh, of course, I just had a bathing suit because I didn't have any diving suit at that time. And uh, the water in the lake was fairly warm. So I went down underwater, and first thing that happened is I got a mask squeeze, so my mask started filling up with blood. So I came to the surface and figured out I hadn't read something yet. So I read some more, and then I learned that uh, you're supposed to clear your ears by blowing gently, and I got that worked out. And I swam around the lake for a while, then I wanted to go in the sound down at uh, Silicon, but the water was really cold. So I did it in the bathing suit the first couple of times. That's when I figured I needed a suit that you're supposed to dive in. Mm -hmm. And I got the first rubber suit called a scuba totes that rolled at the waist and leaked a lot. And uh, that, that sort of got me into it. That's how I got inspired. And that's how I started diving. Yeah. And later, I took formal courses. Yeah. That was in 54. What are your, some, some of your early diving memories or mentors? Mentors? People that, that mentored you, besides E.R. Cross, who mentored you through the book. Yeah, he, uh, he actually mentored me from the very beginning, but I guess I guess my mentors were basically the writers the, of the books mm -hmm. uh, that I mentioned uh, because I didn't really know divers to that degree. I, uh, the Air Force sent me to a diving school and uh, I did, uh, I had some Navy chiefs that were mentors, but they were also antagonists. <laughs> It made me run around, try to bury river rafts and stuff like that, yeah. which I didn't think had much to do with diving. Yeah. But, uh, but we had some good training. It was the pre-course to the Naval Underwater Swimmer School mm -hmm. um, before you go to the EOD portion that where you had become frogman, yeah. That was in the Air Force. Yeah, and then I went back to the Air Force base at uh, Payne up in Everett and developed an underwater search and recovery team because we had airplanes that would go in you know, off of our bases that were in shallow water. So I did that pretty much the last six months of my, uh, and of course I, I was uh, torn between going to flight school mm -hmm. 
for becoming a, a diver. And uh, it was time for me to get out of the Air Force after five years. And I decided I was reading underwater. I was reading uh, Skin Ever magazine, sitting on a big log down at Muckle Teal. And uh, I decided then that I would take my discharge and go to deep sea diving school. And so in uh, February of 59, I was in deep sea diving school. Mm -hmm. uh, and then I did uh, five, quite, almost five years of commercial deep sea diving uh, in Mark V gear, the big helmeted gear. On dams? And On dams in, uh, in the, in the, uh, along the north coast of the United States. I dove in uh, uh, Garrison Dam in North Dakota, uh, Hungry Horse Dam in Montana, Grand Coulee. I did jobs in each one of these. Um, and uh, Rocky Reach and Bruce Rapids. So I don't even quite a few, put in probably a little over a thousand hours in commercial Mark V gear. Wow. And uh, I had, I was, did some uh, underwater uh, sheet piling, uh, burning in uh, um, in Bonners Ferry, Idaho, it was the coldest dive job I've ever done. It was about four and a half to five hour shifts, and I'd come out of there so cold, and my boss, Bill Harris, I worked for Bill Harris Divers, the only thing that would warm me up, he would take me to the American Legion Club and feed me brandy. <laughs> <laughs> and the brandy sort of started up here and just worked its way down. Yeah. You know? But I swear to God, you could not get warm after those dives. Yeah. No matter how much underwear you put on. Yeah. Yeah, it was really cold. Those are hurling diving mentors. Bill Harris was one of them. Yeah. My boss that I worked for. But basically, I think the authors of the diving books. Mm -hmm. yeah. now, I know that uh, uh, your now instructor number is A29. A20. A20. Mm -hmm. Somebody else is A29. I keep getting mixed up with yeah. whoever that is. Uh, now, the A stands for affiliate. So That's you didn't go through a training program. How did you get involved with NAWI? Okay. Uh, at that time, um, Al Tillman was uh, the director. Yeah. And a lot of us had been trained and had been teaching scuba before NAWI ever became an entity before the first course in 60, I think it was. Mm -hmm. And uh, we were scuba diving instructors. Uh, I'd been through the YMCA program. Okay. And, uh, and since I was pretty prominent in the area teaching diving, Al thought it was a wise idea to go get all the other instructors that were qualified and were, were teaching to become an affiliate of NAWI to strengthen the organization, which I thought was an extremely intelligent move on his part. And then rather than us being at loggerheads and, uh, and you know, being in different organizations, we could support the organization. And it wasn't long after that, I attended an, IT, an ICC down in, in Oregon mm -hmm. uh, and in Portland. Yeah. And I did that uh, uh, in order to make myself familiar with the ITC pro with the ICC program, yeah. and that's where I met Jerry Gray and Al Beal. Right. And they were going through the classes down yeah. there. There was uh, an evolution of instruction equipment in the early years, the 60s and 70s. What do you recall of some of those? What the equipment was like, what the instruction was like, and how it evolved and improved. Okay. Well, my first suit was a scuba totes that I ordered out of Skin Diver magazine. Mm -hmm. When it came, it consisted of a rubber pants with a long waist and a shirt with a long waist. And what you did is they gave you a rubber ring that you pulled around. It was pretty tight, pulled it over your shoulders or up around your feet, and you got it up, and what you did is you folded the top part of the suit down so it came down around your knees and then you, the, the pants, and then you pulled the top of the shirt 
down against it. And then you put the rubber ring in there and roll the two together up to make a watertight seal. And that was a scuba totes. And it had a, a cap that came around here and then you put your mask on. And then after that, that suit didn't do too well. It leaked quite a bit and uh, didn't fit all that well. But it got me through diving in the Puget Sound uh, enough. And it, and it came with one inch web belt with cast iron weights, which was gigantic pain yeah. because they rolled and they hurt your hips. And and then, then with the evolution came to the lead weights, the wider belt and the uh, Bell Aqua suits, which were the front entry, the back entry and the waist entry, Bell Aqua suits. And I had a front entry. So I got a front entry suit. And at that time, the the main topic of conversation in the dive shops, of which there was only one or two at that time, it was, uh, which is now underwater sports, but it was uh, Puget Sound Divers. So no, uh, and Gary Kepler and Dale mm -hmm. Dean started that shop. Yeah. And uh, so we'd go in there and they'd say, uh, Hey, there's a new way to tie that thing and put the clamp on it. So they tell you fold it this way and fold it that way and then roll it then make another fold and then put the clamp on and now it won't leak. But it always did. Yeah. Somehow it leaked. And if it didn't leak and you're on a night dive, the crab would pinch it and make it leak from the, from the feet up. Yeah. So you're always full of water somehow. But, uh, but the scuba... Bell Aqua era passed by because maybe a year later I went into the dive shop and I was training divers at, at Payne and Gary said, Spence, you got to see what we got. And he had this big stack of rubber in the back of neoprene rubber, about quarter inch thick, big stacks of these sheets. And he said, it's a new suit. And he said, it's a wetsuit. And I said, well, I got a wetsuit. <laughs> I said, it wasn't supposed to be. But... Not supposed to be. And, and by the way, the way you showed me the last time didn't work either. <laughs> so anyhow, he said, uh, he said, no, no, you put it on and you actually get wet, but you stay warm. You don't even know you're in the water. He said, I think I got one here that'll fit you. So I climbed into that thing, pulling hair all the way. And I finally got it on and I walked out into Lake Union. That's where it was at. And I walked up to my waist in the water and I thought, he's right, I don't feel anything. And I got clear up to my armpits. I didn't feel anything. I floated around for a little while. I come back in, I said, I need one. And I need them for my diving group. So I got the money from the Air Force and he made suits for all of us. And that was our wetsuit, yeah. right? And then of course, it became the dry suits era. Mm -hmm. And the ones I like best weren't complete dry suits, like the uni suit or, you know, that you could put James Bond uh, tuxedo on and go diving and then strip out of it and go across and have a cocktail afterwards. Yeah. But uh, the one I liked that were partly wet, but not bad. And you, you still had the inflation in the upper portion and it kept you pretty dry up there. And I, I fondly dubbed those suits variable volume damp suits. There you go. <laughs> uh, and then, of course, we had the wider belts and the bigger we uh, the lead weights, mm -hmm. and they were way more comfortable. And then, of course, when you got the dry suits on, you had a lot of air, so you had to wear a lot of weight. Yeah. And, of course, things have trimmed down now. Soda straw life vests that we had, the, the little tube up there and you blew it, but you couldn't blow it very well when your mouth was numb, right? <laughs> trying to blow that thing up. And what did you do for uh, compensating for your <laughs> wetsuit compression prior to having any kind of flotation device? What, what did you do to compensate for that while you were diving? Kick harder. Kick harder. <laughs> so, uh, I remember uh, I used to anticipate the depth that I was going to dive at. I would set my weight build up at that 
you know, six pounds, eight pounds, whatever, and kick harder to get down there when the suit compressor was fine. That's right. But I had no way to control my ass in. Yeah, yeah, that's true too. You know? Yeah, um, that's been some of the problems with the uh, early unisuits. They got yeah. more air in the feet than the head. Next yeah. thing you know, you wound up upside down. Upside down, yeah. yeah. And all you could see is feet sticking out of the water. Yeah. <laughs> oh, so that guy's got a unisuit. Yeah. <laughs> How did uh, submersible pressure gauges change your diving habits? Oh, that was interesting. I think probably, I, I gave a lecture once at Portland at, uh, at a big presentation that they had down there. And my presentation was on the evolution of diving gear. And the first thing I did was held up a two hose regulator and I said, well, here was a two hose regulator we all started diving with. And I said, the big problem was it had two hoses. They were bulky, they float around, they re put resistance and pull against your mouth, you're in current. And, uh, and, but all the bubbles would exhale behind you, which was kind of nice, but too many hoses, too bulky, too big. So then they came out with a single hose regulator and they put the tubes down so it would go past your neck and the bubbles didn't bother you there. And it was just this one round little thing that stuck in your mouth with one hose. And then next thing you know, they said they had to have a submersible pressure gauge. And it came on a hose and it came around so you could look at it and see how much pressure you had in the tank. Prior to that, they had R valves that you could, you could make a reserve not by pulling a lever down like with the old J-valve tanks that we had, but you could push down on it and turn it. Problem is you can't do that when you're wearing it. Yeah. So the reserve was useless on an R-valve tank unless you took the tank off, pushed it down yeah. and turned it and then put it back on, which was kind of a pain. But uh, the, uh, then the submersible pressure gauge was the two O's again. And then the next thing you know, we had to have an inflator valve hose to run the, the dry suits that we had. So then that made three hoses, right? Mm -hmm. And then, uh, then we had a safe second stage for someone to breathe out of rather than buddy breathing. That turned it into a four hose regulator. Yeah. So we started with the two hose, we progressed to a one hose, and then evolved to a four hose. <laughs> Now they're doing, I don't know uh, how many hoses they now got. They're now they're doing um, the hoseless, uh, now, the hoseless, you know, right? hoseless submersible pressure gauges. <laughs> so we've eliminated one hose. And, uh, and well, gone, I remember they came out with lighted gauges. I'll never forget that. And I'm trying to think of the Fairlawn or somebody came out with a lighted gauge. And mm -hmm. I bought one because you have to have the latest, right? Yeah. Well, the first time I took it down it was great. It was nice and light. It was on a night dive, and then the light went out. It was gone. The other useless thing that I thought, lighted gauges came under my useless diving equipment category. Yeah. And then the other one that I loved was the propulsion unit. When they first came out, the propulsion unit, get underwater with them, squeeze that handle, and go like hell, you know, and just go like the Dickens. And then all of a sudden, it would peter out, and then it wouldn't run anymore and you'd be a whole lot more distance away from stuff than you ordinarily would if you were swimming. Yeah. And then you had something that was too bulky to pack but too expensive to throw away. 